Hi there. Welcome to this talk on Google Play Services. My name is Richard Hindman. I head up Android Developer Relations across Europe. And I'm Reto Meyer, the Android Developer Relations Tech Lead. Excellent. And together we are clearly the Android Developer Relations football team. We'll take on any other Developer Relations team if they want it. That is a challenge. So <laughs> let's get started with what is Google Play Services. Kind of just a little bit of background to this. Google Play Services is a single library that brings together all the APIs for Google services and Play services into a single place on Android devices. Android devices uh, version 2.2 and above. This means that you can implement your applications and we can implement our applications without having to worry about device support. Google Play, uh, excuse me. This is the fifth major release we've done of Google Play services and we've become exceedingly efficient at it. If you hadn't all been on the same Wi-Fi network for the last 24 hours, I'd be very sure that you've all got it on your devices already. Maybe conference situations uh, change that a little bit. So Google Play Services is covering uh, Google+, Plus, Google+, Plus Sign-In, uh, Maps, Map Fragment V2, hopefully a lot of you have used already, and Auth. What I mean is, uh, by authentication, uh, authentication is that Google Play Services provides a single authorization API for you to get access to all of our services through the library. You and your users have a consistent way to receive OAuth 2 access tokens for Google services. But even more than that, Google Play services is such a core part of our platform for the Google ecosystem that we need to make sure it's always up to date. We need to make sure that we can do bug fixes and updates outside of the Android framework releases and outside of the carrier release schedule. So of course, it's updated through the Play Store. Why is it on Android 2.2 and above? Well, Android 2.2 and above is now 98.2 and growing percentage of the active Android users that hit the Play Store. Also, Froyo added in some really handy APIs, things like uh, being able to save applications to mass storage. And these are the kind of things that most applications that use Play services are probably going to be using. A few people have asked why we have both Play services and the Android support library. I've been kind of, you have? I had been wondering. Yeah. I hope you know, but it's in the names really. Google Play Services, of course, is supporting our Play ecosystem, making sure that you can use those APIs. The Android support library is an open source library for the Android ecosystem. It's de uh, delivered directly to you, the developers, to include in your applications with the source, and you can use it on all devices that you would like to. So this talk is called What's New in Google Play Services? So let's get into some of the meat of it. Mr. Meyer. So you heard a lot about the new things which we're adding to Google Play services during the keynote yesterday. And there's deep dive presentations for pretty much everything in Google Play services, both the things which we've just released and the things which have been around for a little while. So our goal here today is not to dive too deeply into any individual thing, but give you a bit of an overview as to the things which you may be interested in seeing, particularly if you haven't had a chance to go to all of the other Google Play service sessions so far at I.O. At so let's take a look at some of the most exciting new features that we've re just released here at I.O. 2013. And I think the one which is the most interesting and exciting for me is location-based services. So in addition to the Maps fragments and the Maps V2 stuff which we added previously, we now have the ability to detect location within Google Play services. And there's a reason we brought this in here. We're now able to do much cleverer things. We have a new fused location provider which does all of the hard work for you. So if you've ever used location in your Android app, and I'm sure most of you have, you know that doing so in a way that's efficient while still allowing you to be able to get the best location results can be quite tedious. There's a lot of code you have to write in order to be able to use those best practices. So what the location team have done, have taken all of that hard work, they've put it all behind the scenes behind this Fuse location provider, which is going to do all of that stuff for you. It'll detect which providers are available, It'll figure out when things are turned on, when things are turned off, which provider is providing the best results at a particular time. All of that hard work is done for you. And to use it is actually nice and easy. Like most of the Google Play services clients, you simply have to create the instance first, call connect, and then it will asynchronously bind your service or your application to the Google Play services service. Once that's happened, you're able to treat that location client in exactly the same way you used to handle the old location-based services client. Now, this looks a lot like the naive approach that we used to do back in the olden days, last week. 
we had to specify what our interval was and we had to say what provider we wanted to use to get those location updates. And in most cases, we were usually registering multiple providers or we were using criteria to let the system determine which provider we wanted. But then you've got this problem because, well, GPS is always the best, right? It's always the, the most accurate location. Well, it is when you're outside, but less so when you're inside. And so now you're having to keep track of all those different providers and figure out which is the most appropriate for your current location. Fuse Location Provider does all of that work for you. You just give us an interval. It can be a minimum interval or a maximum interval. And then tell us what your priority is. What's more important? Do you want to get the most accurate results that you can? Or do you want to make sure that the battery lasts as long as possible? Or do you want to leave it up to us and our Fuse Location Provider to try and find the right balance for you? Because no matter what you choose, we're always going to try and get the most accurate result with the least battery. This is just our way of knowing which way to push it, in which direction. So that's one of the big advantages of Fuse Location Provider. And the other thing is, of course, because this is Google Play Services, we can update the logic behind that at any time as part of Google Play Services. And we can push that to your users' devices without you having to do anything. You don't need to recompile your code. You simply set these things once, and we will continue to try and make the results more accurate and more efficient with each release. Not satisfied with just improving all of our location-based apps, the location team have also created a new geofencing API. This works a lot like we probably expected the old proximity alerts to work, but this actually works. So it's going to keep track of all of the geofences from every application and figure out which of our, of our providers we should be using based on how far away we are from the boundaries around each of those geofences. So we create those boundaries simply by specifying a particular location and a radius around it. And whether we're interested in, app, in users who move into or out of, or both, of that boundary condition. And so because this is all handled by the central fuse location provider, all of the geofences from every app are known to us. And so we can figure out what should we be using. Should we stick with GPS? Should we go back to cell ID because we're far enough? Because we know how far we are from the boundary. So this means that you get to take advantage of all of this contextual information around location without having to follow the user every step of the way, without having to do all of that complex analysis to figure out whether you want to turn on GPS or turn on cell or Wi-Fi triangulation or any other technology that is made available. We'll do all of that hard work for you, make sure that you get notified whenever it is relevant. Now, because the location team are overachievers, never really satisfied with just making things better and making things work, they've decided that they want to introduce something completely new. And so now we have activity recognition. So now not only can we tell where a user is, but we can tell what they're actually doing. So we know whether they're standing still, whether they're running, whether they're cycling, whether they're driving. And now you can use this information either to create entire new categories of apps. So you can have an app, say, as a fitness app. And rather than having to say what activity you're doing, the activity detection can tell you. Activity recognition can figure out exactly what they're doing and fill in those details. So you can use it that way. And this is how you, uh, you request those uh, activity updates. You just simply set what interval you're interested in and then specify a pending intent that's going to get triggered whenever the activity changes. And so now we can be clever about this. So we can say, OK, maybe we're just interested in all the changes so we can track that and do something useful. Or maybe we can make our apps more efficient. We can provide a different user experience based on what their current activity is. So maybe it's looking for points of interest nearby. And if we're standing still, we're not moving, the buildings aren't moving, then we can pause, we can disable those updates. And if we're in the car, we want to get those updates as quickly as possible so that the passenger can figure out a good place to eat. Or you can flip it around. Maybe it's sports scores or news and you're standing still and that's when you want to have the most frequent updates. And when you're cycling, the phone is in your pocket, you may as well disable those updates entirely because if you're not looking at your phone, if you're not in a position to be able to look at your phone, then there's no point firing up the cell radio in order to get those downloads. So it's really a way that you can either utilize this information to create entirely new apps or more efficient apps. It is a brand new API, so it's a really great opportunity to think outside the box, to figure out how can you use this new sensor information to create a better experience, more efficient experience for your users. Now, I'm not going to go into any more detail here. Uh, like I said, we want to cover everything pretty quickly. Um, the good news is that Walid and Jekama have already presented all of this information. And if we had a time travel API 
built into Android and Google Play services. You could go back in time and watch it live earlier today. Unfortunately, that's not going to be possible. Uh, well, but haven't it will... released that API yet? Uh, the back in time time travel API? No, that was delayed. Oh, okay. until... It's not far. It's only 11.15. Yeah, we should talk <laughs> about this later. Yeah, no. Secret stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so check it out on YouTube. That's close enough. You can rewind time effectively and see all of the good information. They dig much deeper, looking at the details as to how this was done, what you can do to really take advantage of all of these APIs within your applications. Uh, anything else uh, that you want to talk about today, Rich? Sure. Of course, we've got something else. We've got the thing that I'm most uh, impressed with in the latest set of Google Play services is Google Play Games. Everything's better when it's competitive, right? No? Is that just me? Hopefully, some of you have already been playing the new Google Play Games. So you've seen the enormous leaderboard outside. Uh, is anyone on the leaderboard? No, come on. Yeah, one or two people at the back. That's good stuff. They're just shy. <laughs> so the things we're talking about with Google Play Games, achievements, Leaderboards, cloud save, and real-time multiplayer with invitations. Because what's multiplayer without invitations? It is a game by yourself. Right. <laughs> That's not multiplayer. <laughs> so you may not have spotted this before, but how do you manage all of this great new stuff? Inside the new Google Play Developer Console, you're going to get a little tab in the top left corner, the little Play Games logo, and you can tap on that. And then from inside the new uh, layout, you'll see the ability to add in your leaderboards, your achievements, things like that, straight into the Play Developer Console across platforms as well. It supports iOS and web. Not only that, but also, if you have a look in the Play Store now for Beach Buggy Blitz, the game that they're all playing out there, you'll see as you scroll down the Play Store listing, it says supports multiplayer, uh, supports leaderboards and achievements. I don't think that one is multiplayer. But users are going to know which of the Play services you've integrated into your application before they install it. Just adding a bit more compelling. So then inside the actual game, we provide you with default look and feel for achievements. You can see the little dialogue that appears and the entire achievement screen. So you can just drop this in straight away if you want. This is like a whole just chunk of code. Drop it in. It's going to work fine for you. Or you can get access to the raw data and integrate it as you uh, previously would make it look and feel like your application. The same applies to leaderboards. Again, there's a default look and feel for the leaderboards if you want, and users will recognize it and understand that it's Google Play Games, or you can get access to the leaderboards. And Hugo hopefully won't be at the top. So now you've got leaderboards. You've got achievements and that are going to follow you around from device to device. So it only really makes sense if, with those achievements, you're following your game state around with you. What you really need is some sort of cloud save service. What would you call something like that, though? Well, I don't know. We call those the cloud save service. So with cloud save, you now have four 128K uh, blocks of data that you can store the user's data in for that application. Unfortunately, this huge chunk of data doesn't come out of their drive space. Cause that's lucky. I mean, that's almost half a meg per half game. A, I know, right? Yeah, Ten you, games, you like five make sure megabytes. That's a, yeah, yeah, that's a lot. So you get this chunk of data that you can take out of, uh, that doesn't come out of the drive space. You synchronize the, the state, uh, maybe for the four chunks. You could have one chunk for avatar, another chunk for their profile information, game progress, things like this. Store them and synchronize them. Cloud Save also comes with conflict resolution strategies as well. If you want to find out more about that, again, go back in time to yesterday this time. We certainly haven't released that API and watch new developments in mobile gaming which is a crazy name. That's, that seems like a really simple title, though. I mean, I know. Who would actually call a talk New Developments in Mobile Gaming? That. Someone who had something to hide. The talk was called An Introduction to Play Games Services. Thanks. So in the future, when this comes out on YouTube, look for An Introduction to Play Game Services, and you'll find out more details about all of that. Maybe unsurprisingly, this is all backed by Google+. So you add the Google Plus sign into your application, and then you get access to all these fantastic Play Services. For even more details, there's another one. There's a lot of Play Games talks going on. Where are a few? Advanced Games Developments Topics, which also sounds like a cloaked talk title, but I didn't go and check. So now we've backed all that data up. Let's restore Rito to his former position and see what's next. So one of the other really exciting um, new parts of Google Play Services, and most of the ones I'm talking about today, actually existed in the world before Google Play Services, but have recently been brought into the fold. And that is certainly the case for Google Cloud Messaging. This is already an API which hopefully many of you are very familiar with to help make your charter transfers that much more efficient. So we've now pulled that into Google Play Services, and as part of that induction process, we forced the team to build some new APIs as well. So hopefully you're all very familiar with the basics behind Google Cloud Messaging, and that's the fact that you can have your server update your client to tell it when it needs to do a refresh. 
So in the bad old days, we used to set repeating alarms, and at best, maybe they were non, uh, they're inexact repeating alarms. But either way, you were still waking up the device, turning on the radio, pinging a server, just to say, hey, is there anything I need to download? And most of the times, the answer was no. And even if the answer was yes, it's like, yeah, two hours ago would have been useful. And so what Google Cloud Messaging lets you do is have the server notify each of your clients when it's time, when there is new data, so that you can reduce the amount of radio traffic, reduce the amount of battery use associated with those transfers by only making them happen when you know there is data to transfer. Now, one of the exciting new things that we've added is the ability to go the other way around. So as you heard in the keynote yesterday, we can now have a system where you can create a persistent XMPP connection with your server and the Google Cloud Messaging server. This gives you now the ability to send messages from your device back to your server over this connection without you having to maintain that con persistent connection using something like a hanging get or something equivalent to that. We'll do that, we'll do that once, and we'll do it in a way that we know is going to work across carriers and be as efficient as possible. So it gives you that ability to have that low latency, that high reliability connection to send data backwards and forwards without having to do it all yourself using the infrastructure that we use for all of our services. And you can take it a step further as well. So you can use this same technology to now send messages from, one, from, from your app running on one device to the same app running on other devices. So if you have things like a notification, and it pops up on someone's phone, and they handle it, they swipe to dismiss it, they snooze it, but that same notification is going to now be transmitted to all of your other phones. So what this API lets you do is basically send that message to say the user has handled it, it has been actioned, you can remove it. This is really nice. This is a great way of demonstrating to people that your app is aware of their ecosystem. It knows that they have more than one phone. It's not just an app that runs on all of these devices. It's built around them. It understands who they are and what their needs are. And so by doing that, it just works the way kind of people expect it should. I've already, I've already dismissed this notification. It shouldn't appear anywhere else. Implementation from the client side is really straightforward. You get a new Google Cloud Messaging client. You call send. You specify either a project ID if you want to talk directly to the server, or a notification ID if you want to transmit this to other devices. Server side is a little bit more complicated, not really my wheelhouse. So I'm going to leave that to Francesco, who is uh, in this room, I think, directly after us to give us all the details and exactly how you can use both these new APIs and all of the previous uh, Google Cloud Messaging APIs as part of Google Play services. Would you like to uh, talk about the next one, Rich? Sure. We like to write services that are simple to implement and get out of the way of the flow for users. They just make everything more simple across the board. Google Wallet have announced here at I.O. that they've launched Google Wallet Instant Buy. Excuse me. There are some restrictions on it. You need to be a, a whitelisted user. It's probably just US only for now. But you can go and talk to the guys downstairs at the wallet stand if you want to register for it. The flow that this gives you is that you can now sell physical goods inside your Android <laughs> applications using the authenticated Gmail account on the device and the Google Wallet on the device. So as you're selling your physical goods, your Android applications up there, there'll be a, an instant buy with Google Wallet button inside the app. And then they can just tap that. There's no credit card details needed. There's no login needed. Everything's just a simple, straightforward flow. It just gets charged through the wallet on the device. And you can ship the goods to the address that that provides you with. So thanks to the Google Wallet team for that. Uh, there was a talk again yesterday on that one. What's new with mobile payments on Android? If you're watching this in the future, you'll be able to grab that straight away. Great. So, I mean, that all sounds pretty good. How do, I, uh, how do I get this? How can I actually use this? The whole of Play Services comes through the Android SDK Manager. Hopefully, you all know where the Android SDK Manager is already. Yeah, lots of nods in the room. So, the Android SDK Manager is under the window menu in Eclipse and the tools menu in the new Android Studio or IntelliJ. You pull that up and scroll right down to the bottom, and there'll be an item down there for Google Play Services. Once you install that, it will install the Google Play Services package into the URL that's above my head somewhere, Extras Google Google Play Services. So if you've got it installed, you can go and check it out there. And inside there, there's the samples for it. You've got some documentation, and you've got the client library as well. The, one of the samples is called Panorama, because one of Google Play Services is Panorama, which enables you to load up the panoramas and photospheres you've taken with your Android devices and display them uh, inside your application. So using the Panorama sample, I'm going to run through quickly how you would use Google Play services inside Android Studio and inside Eclipse. In Android Studio, you're going to go for uh, create project from existing sources. You're going to run through and find that 
uh, extras, Google uh, Play Services directory on your machine, and you're going to import uh, the panorama sample. We recommend that you also copy the Play Services library into your workspace. So when Play Services is updating to different versions through the SDK manager, it doesn't change the one that you're using. Multiple projects will be running off it. That's a recommendation for Eclipse and IntelliJ users. So then in IntelliJ, or Android Studio, you're going to have to create this uh, module. And because Google Play Services includes resources as well as class files, the resources are kept in the project and the class files are kept in the jar file. So you need to import the module as a project, first of all, for Play Services, and then also import the jar file as a library and create dependencies on both of those. If you miss out one of these steps, unfortunately, you're going to get, like, maps will be in red in Android Studio because it can't find the classes because you didn't import the jar file. This is going to be much easier in the future as we're going to have a Maven artifact for Play Services. So with the Gradle build system, we'll do the dependency management for you. Eclipse, very similar flow. You're going to go through, you're going to copy Play Services library into your workspace. You're going to import that. Uh, also import the panorama sample. In Eclipse, you just need to make the one dependency. You make the dependency from the panorama sample onto the library. And Eclipse figures out there's also a jar file in there and imports that for you. So it should look like this one in Eclipse. Of course, some of our services, like Maps, use uh, APIs and API keys as well. And Rito's going to tell you how to get hold of an API key. Thanks, Rich. So the way this works is that you need to uh, start by going to the API console. And you can find that at code.google.com slash API slash console, which is always tricky for a lot of us to remember, because my default is always to go to developer.com android.com. But nonetheless, if you go there, you can go into the services where you'll see a long list of APIs, and you simply choose the ones which you want to utilize uh, and turn it on. So it's actually pretty straightforward. Now, of course, if we just gave you an API key, which you could cut and paste and start putting into your applications, it would be really easy for nefarious characters like this one or this guy to just steal your API key and start using your quota would make it hard for you to track what your app is doing. If there are quota restrictions, it could very easily start eating all of yours. And so to mitigate against that, we make sure that all of the keys that we have are linked to a particular certificate and a particular package name so that only you can use your API key. That way you can get full control over the list of apps and certificates that you want in the API access part of the console. Now, that, once you've gone through that process, that is going to give you an API key. And so now this, because it's side, or at least it's associated specifically with your certificate and your package name is unique, you can put it into your manifest as shown here, and all of your Google Play services will start working. OK. Something on auth. No matter how many times I go through this, auth and auth is always confusing. Authentication and authorization shouldn't have been called the same thing because it's just annoying or at least start with the same name. Authentication is securely identifying the party, so those Google accounts on your device are authenticated. Authorization is getting tokens to, to access the services for that identified party, for the authenticated party. Google Play Services is offering standardized authorization for the authenticated accounts, not just for uh, products that are inside Google Play Services, but also for Google APIs on the web as well. Previously, the flow for getting authorization tokens for Google APIs was a bit of a pain, involved web views and some other things. Some people wrote some nice libraries for it, but hey, there you go. Now, with Google Play Services, you can get hold of these tokens much more easily. So it kicks off with choosing an account. You want the user to choose the account that you're going to use to authorize to get into the services, and that's just one line of code. You use the account picker filter on Google services and um, Google accounts, and it shows a dialog to the user, which you've probably seen before where they can choose one of their Gmail accounts, just one line of code. Then before you go ahead and use Google Play Services, you just want to check that it's there, that it's on the device, that it's the right version, and that it's not disabled, because people could do that if they really felt like it was necessary for some reason. And then again, that's just one line of code. Google Play Services util uh, is Google Play Services available. That can come back with some error codes, maybe, in, in these rare cases. If it does, we have a handy get error dialog uh, that you can call. And that will show a localized error dialog up to the user. And hopefully, they can resolve the issue from that. So now you've got Google Play services is definitely on the device and working. You've got your authenticated Gmail account or Google Apps account that you're going to use to log into the service. So now you need the access token for their service. Again, 
one line of code, the Google Auth Util get token. You're passing in the Gmail account that came back, and you're going to chain together the scopes of the services that you want to get access to. In this case, we're looking at the Plus Profile and the YouTube read-only scopes. But you could chain multiple different scopes for Google services and Google Play services that you wanted to get access to in this authorization. When you do this, the user will get another handy little dialog saying, this application wants to access YouTube and your Plus Profile. And they can click through there and see more details of exactly what that means. And they'll hit OK with any luck and you can get access to the data. If it's Google Play Services data, you're just using the token with the library. If it's one of our web APIs, you're going to get that authorization token, put it on the end of a URL, and get access to one of our APIs. Uh, anything else from you, Mr. Meyer? Yeah, I think there's one more thing that we wanted to add. We could plus one it, if you will. Painful puns are our specialty. Painful pun. <laughs> add one more thing to the deck. We should have rehearsed this. This could have been better. Yeah, probably not. So. The thing is, you can plus one anything. Anything which has a distinct URL, you can plus one it. So that means you can, plus, you can have a plus one button to plus one your app in your app, which isn't a bad idea, but it's kind of a simple approach. If you've got content within your application and it's anything which has a URL to be able to go to anywhere else, you can have a plus one button for that as well. So whether that's a news article, a recipe, a TV show, anything which is within your app and has that URL, you're also able to add a plus one button to it. Excellent. So I think we've probably convinced people that there's enough stuff here to start playing around with. Is there a way that they, how, how would they go about testing this, make sure it actually works? Testing Google Play services is a question we get quite a lot on Google+. Plus. It is a lot, yeah. It's a painful question yeah. because when you're testing Google Play services, you can go and buy a device. You can go and buy an Android 2.2 and above device. Nexus devices are great, low cost of entry if you want to test Google Play services. You want Android 2.2 and above and, of course, the Play Store on it, and you'll be able to test your Play services on it. I, I don't know, Richard. That doesn't seem like a good enough answer to me. We can't expect everyone to go out and buy a device just to test things. Really? I don't have a much better answer. No, actually, I said you can test on a device because we do have one more thing. Ah. Finally, da 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 da. <laughs> I haven't seen this. What's coming? We have a Google Play services emulator as well, finally, so you can... One thing? Wow, okay. It's based on the Google APIs emulator. We'll be updating it with every major release of Play Services going forward. So even if you do have a device, you can use this emulator to test some of the other form factors, but it means you don't actually have to have a device. And you can use the GPU emulation on there and the other features. Exactly. So all of you who are using emulators for any kind of testing, and particularly if you're doing things with uh, like multi-device testing, this is a, a great way to be able to do that. And we particularly put it at the end just so those of you who waited for the full length of the session would, uh, would get to have a seat. You went through the pain to get that one thing. So the requirements for it, you've got the Google, you have the real emulator uh, installed, you have the Google APIs installed, and you have the Play Services installed, which hopefully you'd have anywhere if you're developing for Play Services. Absolutely. Makes sense. That's what we've got for this talk. Thank you all very much. And uh, if you've got any questions, we have microphones dotted around, uh, and you can talk about Google Play services. We also have Jeff over here from the Play Services team. So if you have any really technical questions that we're clearly not going to be able to answer, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff can. will stand up and save the day for us. <laughs> Thanks very much. Will someone come into the microphone? Hey there. Hi. Hi. Is the Play Services emulator, do you have an x86 image for that or only ARM? Um, it hasn't been launched yet. Right now, I've only seen an ARM one. You've only seen it on ARM? I've only seen an ARM one personally, yeah. But okay. You never know. Jeff, any? No. No. That's actually, you can talk to Zaventor on the tools team about the emulator they're launching that. Okay. Yeah, you should check if we've got any uh, extended people. Uh, mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, hey, please. Uh, uh, are you planning on uh, releasing the web view as uh, a Google Play service so that it can be updated across uh, different uh, versions of the OS? Uh, it's a good question. I don't, certainly not anything which we've done at this point. I'm not sure if there are any future plans. It's as usual with anything Google. We can't speak about future plans, but it's not anything that I'm currently aware of. Yeah, the great thing for me is finally being able to test apps with the new map fragment, the V2 map fragment, inside the emulator whilst you're developing is just really handy. And uh, this panorama example as well. I've just checked. We don't have any questions coming in off the uh, live moderator. So we can carry on. Yep. Uh, hey, uh, this is awesome. But uh, how is the uh, Play Store upgrade rate, uh, upgrade rate and upgrade uh, velocity? Is there any plan on that to ensure users always get the latest version? The, uh, so the question is the uh, frequency with which or the rate at which we update Google Play services on devices? 
it's uh, very, very, very fast. <laughs> so we usually, it usually uh, I think we push it out to everyone within about a week, I think, yeah. and that's conservatively speaking. So usually whenever there's a new Google Play services update, we push that out to all devices very quickly. So as long as Google Play is installed, they will get that uh, update almost instantly. For regular viewers of the tech press, you may have noticed we started releasing this version at the start of the week. Yes. <laughs> it got noticed. Uh, Next one. So. so I feel like this question might have been asked before, but uh, I didn't hear an answer to it. Um, how much uh, working together do the Google Play services expect to have? Uh, in particular, you have the uh, activity recognition and location services. One of, them, one of the examples you had was, OK, if I'm on a bike, uh, update more frequently, update less frequently if I'm not on the bike. Will the location services automatically do that, or do we manually do that? So, and other situations like that I haven't thought of. <laughs> Absolutely, cover your bases. Yeah, um, one of the advantages of Google Play services is exactly that, is that all of these services are backed by Google infrastructure and Google services, and so they can work together really, really well um, and start to do clever things working together rather than in isolation. So it's really about taking them out of their product silos and putting them in one place where they can be managed and where they can take advantage of the functionality which each of the different components brings. And the example from location is perfect um, in that it does, or the Fuse location provider already does do some clever things based on what activity you're doing to, to modify those rates. So, absolutely. Hey, I have a question about game services. Is it ever appropriate to use game services for non games? I'm thinking so of like yeah. four square badges. Right, certainly something like Cloud Save is very appropriate for non games as well. Uh, using achievements, you could use achievements outside of games if you wanted to. Yeah, I, I don't think that there's any restrictions around uh, having to be in the one of the games categories in order to use the services. It's just that they're designed specifically for that. So the risk you have is that if you if it almost does what you want and you're hoping that it gets changed to be able to take it into account that edge case, if it's not in a game, it's much less likely to have that covered. But if you find something useful, don't let the uh, don't let the title dissuade you from using it. Hi, the geofences, uh, they said it's 100 per client, per application, per mm -hmm. user, or is it just per application? Per application. Yeah. Um, do I next? Oh, the back, how, yeah. how does uh, the Google Play services uh, version the, the app so that like, they work with the Google Play services that they need? Like, do they prevent the update of the app if like, the Google Play services installed on the on the system is not does not match the version, or how does it handle versioning? Mm. Uh, so the sorry, you saying something like maps? Like no, I mean or? the apps. Like suppose I'm an app and I use Google Play services, which mm -hmm. requires a certain API level in the Google Play service, and the guy has not updated his Google Play uh, app. So how does it handle versioning between the apps? Right. So what we do is we push out the new version of Google Play services to everyone basically straight away. If for whatever reason that update hasn't happened, the first time an app runs, which requires a newer version, that will force it to pull that new um, that new download down. So it'll happen. I, th I think at the time when you install the app. No. Nope. When you run the app. Yes. Yep. When you run the app. <laughs> so the first time that uh, you make that check, it will uh, it will ping Google Play and, and request to uh, to and download. What the is the mechanism of making that check? Sorry, I just follow a quick. Follow. Uh, Google Play Services dot, is Google Play Services available? Yeah. Google Play Services Util. It's in the slide deck. Hey, when you were talking about Cloud Save, you mentioned a limitation of like four buckets each of which mm -hmm. is 128K or something. Sure. Is that a strict limit and is there a way to go beyond that? <laughs> using yes, Cloud Save, <laughs> it is a strict limit and using Cloud Save, there isn't a way to go beyond it. But if the Drive guys were here, they'd be talking a lot about how you could just use the Google the, the, Drive the, API. So there are things you can do. And because uh, this is, again, it's a good example where um, in this example, it's, it's sort of optimized for games. And we want to make sure that whether people have a Drive account or not, they can still take advantage of, uh, of persisting this state across. Um, so if you do want to have more data um, and share it across devices, you totally can. Mm -hmm. uh, the Drive team have a, a great API to do exactly that. And I think they even had a session uh, earlier today um, going into a bit more detail. So if that's a use case you're looking for, that's probably a good place to look. Okay, but the two aren't going to interoperate such that the user can see, like, this is my game save state. Right. And if there's something that is larger in there, it's going to be a totally separate thing. That's totally separate. Drive, right? yeah. Okay. yeah. Thanks. Hey. Are you, are you storing the geofences in the device or in the cloud? On the device. On the device. So, yeah, why? So it's, why? Because it's the device which is moving around. Um, in fact, we want to go the opposite way. So for geofences, we want to try and make them um, as much a part of the device. If we could push it into hardware, that would be even better. And, uh, so it's really about trying to make sure you don't have to make an internet connection, start up the radio, which is quite costly. 
um, in order to be able to do some of these checks, which we may not, um, may not need to do. So for your own apps, if you need more than 100, uh, 100 geofences, then that may be something you want to do. But the idea here is to reduce the dependency on the cloud. Uh, hi. Uh, will you provide the play services as a separate jar file for download? Or what's your thoughts on Kindle Fire? Right. I mean, Kindle Fire is outside of the Google ecosystem. It doesn't have the Play Store. We're not pushing the, the Play services. We don't have our, our apps on it. So the Play services is specific to the Google devices. Part, part of that is we want to make sure that um, you know, we have certain assumptions around everything within the ecosystem. And we're able to have um, the CTS tests to make sure that the devices have all of the features that we need in order to take advantage of most of these services. And so. That gives us the infrastructure we need to be able to safely push this out to everyone and know that it's just going to work. Um, so we haven't, I don't think it's a priority to, to take that out and make it available as a separate download. Okay. So uh, there's no plan to push Play Store to Kindle Fire, is that right? Uh, <laughs> I think you probably want to ask the Amazon guys, or at least someone with a higher pay grade than me. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's a Doesn't different like product, a question. taking advantage of the, uh, the open nature of, of the Android operating system, and you know, they've done a great job. But I'm sure if they wanted to submit it to the CTS test suite and get approved and go through that, they could. But okay, it's not, um... <laughs> question about auth. Uh, mm -hmm. When will developers be able to get refresh tokens for offline access without having uh, WebView? Without having WebView. Like client authentication. Oh. Huh? So we need to <laughs> Thanks, access yeah. your data from the back end. <laughs> from our back Right, end. right, right. So not going through Google Play services, but no. going through server to server? Or? No, we want to get the refresh token uh -huh. to access uh, Google data from our back end, but without having WebView on the client. How can we, when we will be able to? Do this. I, don't know. That I think it's like a little beyond uh, either of our knowledge. But what I suggest you do is head over to the uh, office hours on the third floor, and we'll uh, we'll try and find someone who can figure out exactly what the answer is. Oh yeah. So, sorry. Hi. Actually, my question related to previous. Um, do you plan to have a backend services for Google Play services to apply them for other? App stores like from reviews from iStore or whatever. Right. As as is usual, these talks we don't make uh, announcements or talk about roadmaps. Because it prevents to using to your remit. some services when you extend sure. when you plan to have multiple cross cross store application. It prevents to you to use Google service and you want to use your own service if it cannot be used in a similar way in another store. But if you have a backend service supporting that, then we can easily trust and go with that. So you'd basically want to have a lot of the functionality from Google Play services made available to servers rather than to device clients, yeah. is that right? Uh, again, I think it's probably not a priority. Um, I mean, most of those things would appear in the Google Web APIs, right? So things like the Places API, Maps APIs, things like that. Uh, yeah, there, tends to, be, there tends to be different ways to, to access from the server. I mean, all, Google Play services is all about trying to create the best uh, experience on the device. So anything that you want to do client side, there's generally a Google API for that, uh, which you can use. It's just separate from that. Um, and the ones which are in place services which don't have a back end and component. Um, there's far more APIs than I can remember. If you do go to apis.google.com, uh, the, the API console, and have a look through the APIs, there's hundreds and hundreds of them in there. So it's hopefully there's one that does exactly what you're looking for. Running very low on time. Maybe the last question. Or maybe there's just two guys left. A couple more. Uh, my question is about uh, the cloud save service. Mm -hmm. When uh, is the data automatically cleared at any points, or do you have to manually clear it? That's, ooh, that's a good question. Mm. I'm not 100% sure. I think you need to manually clear it. I know that it does, um, it does versioning and, and, and collision and all those sorts of things to make sure that it's always um, using the most up-to-date version. In terms of deleting, I think you probably need to handle that. The documents are now up at developers.google.com forward slash games. So you can have a look at the conflict resolution at developers.google.com slash games. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so now that Play Services is now providing features that are traditionally considered an operating system component, uh, it seems like Android is being split from an open source project into an open source base and a closed source OS, similar to like Darwin and OS X. Uh, is this 
does this represent a change in Android philosophy, or do you guys plan to reconcile that later? I wouldn't say so. Um, I think realistically what we're trying to do is offer more services for users. And so we're going to continue to, to build the platform and have as many rich features as possible. And I can tell you the platform team are passionate about making sure that anything that we can build to make the platform better, we should build there. You'll note that the things that we have in Google Play services are things which tend to have not been open sourced in the past or, or contain proprietary Data. So things like the Fuse Location Provider and the logic that it does to be able to reconcile between those different location providers and, and use all of those sensors is, is information that we keep, which we used to have in things like uh, Google Maps, which tended to have better location results than everyone else. So we wanted to share that, make that available to everyone, and that kind of forms the basis around what we're doing with Google Play services. And things like you'll note that location services don't suddenly disappear uh, from the platform. They'll still continue to be there. It's where we can do a value add by opening up our proprietary stuff and making it available for developers. That's kind of where we're trying to go with it. Absolutely. Thank you all very much, then. We're very much out of time. Thank you.